and uh, here. This is a very special TV, and hi, so who are you? Uh, I'm Paul Gray, I'm research director at IHS Market, and I lead our TV research. So, is this cool? What it's are we looking fun. at? This is really fun. So, what we've seen in the past couple of years is that OLED has managed to get recognized by consumers, especially in Western Europe, as being the premium TV technology. Um, I I'll emphasize that often what is the best technology depends on when you're looking at it. If you're watching in a bright room, then probably LCD has an advantage. If you watch in the dark, then OLED has an advantage. But one of the things that TV brands have been trying to do is to make uh, products that bridge that gap so that they're not different. And one of the things that we're really seeing at the moment is lots of new ideas with LCD TV to improve that contrast performance and get those really, really deep blacks that we all enjoy with OLED. So here we see 8K and here is a 4K ULED XD. It's kind of like the Primo dual cell demo right now, no? Right, that's right. So one of the things that you can do with, uh, with LCD is to go to uh, modulate and control the light that's coming through to the LCD panel. All LCD panels leak a little bit of light and by putting an extra panel behind it, then you can reduce the amount of light that leaks out and so you get a better black. So it's to prevent the light leaking, and uh, how close does it get to pixel dimming, which is one of the, the selling points of the OLED, right? Okay, so, so the, uh, the idea with OLED and the key thing that OLED has is that you can uh, just w light up one single pixel in the whole display, for example, should you want to. Um, and that hasn't been possible with LCD without a little bit of a halo. Um, what they've done instead is they've put a panel with 1080p resolution behind it and you use that to control the backlight and obviously you can still have dimming zones but you have millions of dimming zones uh, and that's, that's the principle behind Pretty it. Pretty much 2 million dimming zones, Yeah, right? that's right. Yeah, 1,920 by um, 1,080, so let's call it 2 million. And uh, somehow it's black and white. It's this second layer, the, the second cell, yeah. is is the backlight. Uh, so you've got a backlight, then you have the control layer, and then in front of that you have the conventional LCD that we all know and love so well. Um, and, and the point is that you're then reducing any light that goes to the switched off pixels, and because of that you end up with deeper blacks, and you, the, the leakage is less. And that layer doesn't leak anything? It leaks far, far less. Yep. That 1080p. It's, it's, like another, it's like another LCD layer. So each time, so if you say that, you know, one, one thousandth of the light leaks through, then you add a second one on top of that, and that means that it's a millionth of the light leaks, leaks through. So that's what they mean by a million dimming zones, it's even though it's a, a two million pixels behind, but it's about the leaking. Um, or that, that's right, the so the key, key, key issue on this one is the amount of light that leaks out. So have you looked at this, what do you think? What do you think um, about this 8K dual cell? What you see is the really deep blacks and that really intense contrast that looks just like um, an OLED. And it's got that real OLED-like performance that you can have bright white text, for example, when you're running the credits on a movie on a black screen, and you don't see that gray halo around it very noticeably. Is also, so potentially, this can lower price, Potentially, because the 88-inch 8K is not $88,000, but it's, it's half cheap. of $88,000. It, 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 it's not cheap. It's 40000 something. Yeah. This could potentially be less than $5,000. Uh, I don't know on the prices and costs. On all LCD panels in particular, then the, it always depends on supply and demand. And the crunch one is that an LCD panel fab is like running an oil refinery. You make money when it's full. If it's not full, then you run the risk of losing money and anything that you can do to make sure that your fab is full puts you in profit. Now at the moment, the industry in China has structurally over-invested in LCD capacity. About 20% of it is not being used. Suddenly you've got a technology where almost that extra cell comes at very, very low cost because otherwise it would be doing nothing. And so it's an interesting way for the LCD industry to use oversupply productively to improve product performance. Of course, it depends on cost. And this is now where the engineers are going to start getting really clever and seeing how they can do that. So for example, one way that they may do it is that at the moment you've got two cells 
each of which has two layers of glass and LCD in between. And maybe you make a, something more like a club sandwich where you have three sheets of glass and two layers of LCD in between them. So there's lots of room for imagination from engineers and creativity. So this a lot of action happening right there. Can we can we yeah. just over here? Um, I think I think this one looks yes, also. And as far as I understand, this one is on the market in China already, and it's selling for twenty thousand RMB. So that's like two thousand five hundred. Right. Like that. Um, is not really half the price of an OLED, but potentially it can go down. Um, I don't know about the margin structure yeah. on that one, and of course it's a very it's early project. New. It's a very early product. They've only made a few thousand, and, and therefore costs aren't going to be optimal. And I think everybody at the moment is evaluating what the market reception is to it, how consumers view these things. Do they just want OLED for the sake of having OLED? Um, or is there something uh, something different going on there? So, um, at the moment, it's a, it's a very new product. Um, it's rather experimental. However, it offers another good example about how LCD is such a versatile system and you can really reinvent the different parts of it and squeeze all kinds of different performance out of it. This is the ULED without the XD, yeah. single layer, and it's the top of the class. And I don't think they're trying to, to, to trick it or something. And uh, just with my camera, I can I can clearly see the difference in black levels. Uh, it's just more black here. It's right. like totally black. Yeah. Which is kind of like the selling point of the OLED. Uh, that's right. So the, the, the main thing that OLED has always um, excelled at is if you watch in the dark, then the blacks are black. And uh, as a result, you don't get that rather gray, leaky black level. And uh, how about Nanosys is market leader for Quantum Dot, right? Yep. And um, there's a whole bunch of Nanosys stuff in there. There's right. a Quantum Dots. How does the quality of the colors get better with this ULED XD? Um, so, in the, in the end on, uh, on, on Quantum Dots, then they allow you to have very, very pure colors. If you have a leaky panel, then the, the purity of that color is degraded by the leakage. So going to a um, a panel with a, with, with a dual cell allows you to get that extreme color purity, which of course is what you always see with OLED. So uh, this is exciting in terms of colors, it's exciting in terms of contrast. Uh, they, they are talking about uh, 150,000 contrast ratio. What is OLED talking about in contrast ratio? Um, I, I think the answer is that it's broadly comparable. Um, Nobody can achieve a million to one contrast ratio because actually the light reflecting off your face back onto the screen will degrade the back black level. So over 100,000, I think at that stage, you can say that we take it off the, um, uh, we, we, we take it off the table and it then depends on things like the room conditions, like are you sitting in a room with a white wall? So uh, when I did the interview uh, with Hisense at Display Week, I think he was mentioning about it getting up to dual 4K, but you don't think it's necessary? Um, the risk when you go and add the same resolution is that first of all, you've got to make sure that the two cells match exactly. Otherwise, you, you start seeing that the black stripes in between them um, overlap each other and you get a reduction in the light coming through the panel. How did they align? Um, that's their secret source in the process. So. I think on this one, this is about returns to scale. So what, what one do you get most benefit for least cost? And that's the best value. And whether going all the way down to single pixel is necessary, I think is very debatable. In the end, put the two next to each other, put on your content and see whether you can see a difference. If you can see the difference, then think about how much it's worth to you. If you can't see a difference, don't pay for it. Like all these things. Uh, as far as I understand, the eight 8K demo, which uh, maybe is the first time they show, is more or less the same nits. Uh, I think people. they had one last year. Uh, they had uh, yeah. 8K dual cell. I think cell. they had, uh, not dual cell, no. Dual cell. But uh, more or less the same nits potentially as an OLED, but this one is supposed to have twice the nits. Yeah. It's, it's important to have more nits, no? Uh, potentially yes, reach it is. More than 1,000. But at the same time, you, you, you've got to remember the energy consumption. So that's a warm screen. Um, an 8K screen has 35% less transmissivity in its glass 
compared to a 4K screen because you've got to have all the conductors and things to connect the transistors up and you've got to have the black layers in between the pixels. And, and therefore, 8K screens are less efficient than 4K. Um, if you go and look at some of the energy um, uh, performance of 8K screens, they're using a lot of power. So 65 inch at 500 watts is getting very, very close to the legal limit of what you can have on a TV in Europe. So 8K has an energy consumption problem and the ways that people can use to reduce the energy consumption are going to be critical. Um, is there something to do, so if, if you do an 8K with LCD technology, you're losing four times the brightness or two times or something like that, but in OLED there's no lose, loss, in, but um, they're, they're limited to their... No, I, I mean on OLED you have other problems so related to things like screen loading and so on, so very definitely you can't do resolution for free. Emissive technologies typically have more problems with fine pixel structures than LCD because the energy has to be transported through those pixels and out. Whereas an LCD, of course, it's just a switch. Um, all, all I think is, is clear at the moment is that 8K is another step again that's worse on efficiency, and, and that's a major problem. So, uh, I think this looks really amazing. Uh, it looks like potentially this is the best LCD in market right now. Uh, uh, but there's other stuff happening. There's yeah. other dual layers. So, I, I, I know of at least three brands that have got dual layer that they've shown publicly. I'm sure some other ones have have them in their private areas that they've been showing to uh, to dealers and industry insiders, um, which obviously I can't talk about. Um, at the same time, people are also looking at other ways to solve this problem. So, another way to do it is you put in literally um, thousands and thousands of LEDs and the micro and mini LED technology allows you again to have backlights with many, many, many zones, not 255 like we're seeing at the moment, but maybe uh, 2,000, 10,000 zones. And again, it gets you to that point that you really minimize the amount of light that gets wasted in the back of the panel. So what's gonna be best, uh, dual layer or mini LED? Don't know, like let's wait and see. Dimming. I really have no idea. I think the creativity of the engineers and how people um, design these things and the optical components they put in will be critical. At the moment, I wouldn't want to call it. In the end, it doesn't matter what the spec says, what matters is what it looks like. And often, creating a product that is very well balanced is more important than doing one thing well. So the ones that are publicly announced that are doing dual, dual layer, that's showing stuff, Yeah. is it a company like uh, so, so as an example, then Panasonic's doing an interesting one, which is dual layer with OLED. And it's going to be transparent, and then you can switch the LCD on in the back to give you a good black level. So I think we're really at an early stage. The products that we see at the moment on dual layer are really only prototypes. A few of them have been test marketed, but it's a very immature technology. That the ideas are really just beginning on this one. So they are combining a uh, transparent OLED with LCD? A transparent OLED with an LCD behind it. What's the point in doing well, the... Well, uh, the problem with a transparent display is it's like projection, is that it's only the black level is only ever as black as the ambient lighting condition. Um, and, and so where people have done transparent OLED displays, they look rather fun, but it's, it's a grey and white display. Um, the black level is always very washed out. Um, so to return that black, which is the, of the unactivated screen, then they put an LCD at the back of it. It's a prototype, um, but it's a fun idea, and uh, it, again, it's something interesting to look at. It probably would be more expensive than just an OLED. Oh, yeah. Because you get an OLED and an LCD, well, and you have to align yeah, them and there's everything. There's a lot more components in there. You probably only need a single cell on the LCD, because it's only got to be black and white. Um, but uh, we'll see. I think the, you know we're seeing again a lot more ideas that people are doing on this, and it just goes to show that evolution on LCD is really not finished. How? So is this also a single layer LCD in the back because it's just a black and white 1080p in the back? Um, is this I, I, what I, I, I don't know is ah, the yeah. answer. So. Yeah. Um, I, I yeah. think I'm that it's a 1080. The second layer. How is it, is, I think a 1080p panel, so that for every four UHD pixels, you've got a single lighting box behind that. That only does light black and white. Yeah, that's all you need. 
and it's the same LCD technology than the front layer, more or less. But it's like yeah, uh, exactly. You take out the color filter and you just use an extra light switch that gives you the pattern of a uh, many, many, many zone backlight. Light switch. Yeah, this one LCD is. It's a switch. Yeah, it turns light on and off. So uh, if we jump over just over here. Um, here, Hisense is showing something else. They're showing a, a chip that they have right here. Because uh, my understanding uh, over the past years, we also did a couple other interviews, is that sometimes Hisense or other companies, they have patent panels that, that might be from Samsung or from LG yeah. or something like that. Or they could be from BOE or others. Yeah. And sometimes the main difference is the processing between right. the different brands. So the TV, the, the TV video processor chip is much forgotten. I think most enthusiasts get very, very, very uh, bothered about the make of panel, um, and they forget about the video processing. Now, everybody in OLED is using the same display. There may be some very slight detail differences, but it's basically the same OLED panel from LG display. However, if you put a Sony, a Philips, a Panasonic, and everybody else, um, LG, of course, put their OLED TVs together, you line them all up, then they look different. They look really amazingly different, and that is down to the video processor inside it. So potentially Sony has a really sweet one. That's why some people say they have the best OLED. Um, I, I think on all these things, it always goes with uh, buy what you like. Um, I, I think people emphasize different things. So some people want to make the image look very busy and very exciting. Some people want to make the image look very natural. Um, both are right, and, and it's about taste. Is there any chance that company like Hisense or TCL or Skyworks, which is over here, yeah. uh, is it possible that their engines are up par with the other ones? Um, or maybe I think, even better? I think, I think there's an experience curve. In the end, I, 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 this is a subjective business. In the end, you, you enjoy watching, uh, watching video content, TV, movies, whatever. And, and it, just like music and what kind of stereo to buy or whatever, it depends on what you like. Yeah, it's like saying, what's the best car in the world? Yeah, okay. Um, a Ferrari Scuderia is a pretty great car, unless you want to take three bags of cement home from the builders. Yeah, in which case it's a pretty terrible car. And, and it's about what's appropriate for what you want. And, and I, I, I don't think that there's a case of what's the best TV, it's what's the right TV for you. And uh, here, if you walk over here, there is a... Uh Here's some demos with uh, Hisense showing Android TV, yep. but they also have the Vita. I'm thinking, why doesn't everybody just use Android TV and stop doing all these different... I think that's one of the saddest things about the smart TV whole thing, is that there's fragmentation. Everybody um, should use Android, but Google doesn't want to share the revenue. What's the problem? Right, and so, so this is the key one, is that it's about business models, first of all. Um, I think the other one is that um, it turns out the value proposition of TV is watching TV. Um, and a lot of things in interactivity and app stores and things like that are frankly irrelevant for TV. Um, a TV is a shared device. If you want something personal, you keep it on your phone. If you want to order um, a pizza, you're going to do it with your phone. Why? Because that's got your bank details in it. Would I want my bank details inside the TV? No, because I've got 17 year old children. Yeah, and, and I think that, that that makes them fundamentally different. Um, most people only watch a few channels, most people only use a few video apps, and the question is really whether Android TV is just totally overspecified for the task that is really demanded of it. So that's why, for example, I don't know if it's Hisense or another, maybe TCL, they're using Roku right. in the US. Somehow it's preferred over there, it's simpler, or I don't know. Right, so Roku is a very, very simple user interface. It's extremely clear, it's easy to use, it's stable, it's, it's simple, it does what it says on the packet, and, and that is very, very different from these overcomplicated um, other systems. And, and I think this is always about creating something that is appropriate to the market, and you know, Android TV, is imagining that the phone is a 65-inch smartphone. Sorry, the TV is a 65-inch smartphone. The TV is not a 65-inch smartphone. You do something totally different with it. Most of the time with the TV, you're not interacting with it. You're just watching it. And so 
Um, sure, but maybe maybe this is. Uh, I don't know if the Android TV market is growing. I guess it might probably is. Uh, but uh, isn't it a little bit of a failure on Google's part? It's a huge company. Why can't they make something simple? Um, right, and I th I think one of the the things is that um, Google is an internet company. Google expects products to change every couple of years, to evolve very fast. And then you've got the TV, which most people keep for, say, six to eight years. A, t a device that spends most of its time playing back, not being an interactive device like the phone. Um, and therefore, it, it is something completely different. Um, you know, AI in a washing machine. How often do you want to talk to your washing machine? Well, not very often. Um, do you want to operate your washing machine remotely? No, because you've still got to put the clothes in and take them out. Um, and so I think that often with, uh, with Android, there's a misunderstanding of what people really want to use a TV for, and that they've, they've put too many functions in, most of which aren't used. I think uh, Google should have said from the beginning, 70 or 80% uh, revenue share goes to the manufacturer. They, can, they don't need to like, I think they're scaring them off by you know, wanting to control the future of all revenue. Right. When Google should just be making revenue on their advertising uh, and stuff. And, and I they think, don't need to control the whole thing. Right. And I think the other issues on all this are, of course, uh, personal data uh, and privacy. Um, and very, very definitely, TV set makers are somewhat concerned that Android TV is a bit of a trap. They remember what happened in OS's uh, in PCs, where you just get relegated to being unable to control anything different about your and hardware. And all the profits were just Microsoft and Intel, in, and all indeed. the manufacturers made nothing. Yeah, it was a very, very tough business making PCs, it still is. If they're worried about that in TV, I'd argue it's happened already just between the hyper competition between brands. But again, they see, it, see this as a kind of trap. Also in fairness, and up until very recently, there hasn't been much choice in OS. Suddenly, um, in Europe, we're now getting Roku and Fire TV. We've never had those before, so there's only been one open OS. Um, the US has been very, very different, very diverse uh, world of OSs there. So I think this is introducing more competition into it. And Android TV is a complicated thing, and a lot of the time in the market, then the hardware cost just has not justified um, the extra functionality. I think... Um this bad strategy, and hopefully they'll fix it, but the, what Android TV has kind of missed the thing, it, it, it created a, a place for Netflix and Amazon Prime to just dominate totally. Right. Because it's hard for a startup to start making an app that works in seven different smart TVs. Right. Well, uh, the Netflix and Amazon works everywhere, but a startup cannot develop right. for seven uh, platforms. And, and I, I talked to one company um, who was doing uh, apps for TV, and they said that 75% of their R&D spend was just porting. So that's, that, that's not stuff that's creating new apps, it's not improving the apps, that's just making them that's work. It's a huge and, barrier uh, to the success of uh, the <laughs> smart TVs. So it's a massive barrier to the success. The other problem is with smart TVs is that this is, a, this is a slow selling product by comparison with mobile phones. For every TV that gets shipped every year, then there's five phones. Um, then you split it up between brands and OSs and you end up with very small quantities. Um, it's also not a market that is homogeneous worldwide on a, a couple of mobile phone standards and things like that. You've got lots of local broadcast standards. People use and watch TV differently in every country. Um, and so as a result, it's a very, very, very diverse market. I hope they, it gets better in this thing because I think it's a bit, I'm a little bit disappointed that there's a big happening. <laughs> I think they should just go Android TV. Uh, let, let's let's go let's go over there one more uh, over here. There's uh, there is some uh, interesting aspect ratio going on here, but this is kind of like just a demo, right? Do you think people are going to be buying this? Uh, this is, I think, the third time round we've seen twenty-one by nine. Um, well, all broadcast content is sixteen by nine. So for the rest of the time, you're going to be watching, you know, this is Black a 105 bars. inch TV. Yeah. And so most of the rest of the time, you're going to have a 65 inch TV experience yeah. at 105 inch cost. Um, even when you look at Hollywood content, then if you take the Blu-ray, yes, it has the black bars top and bottom, um, 
but you're then going to be stretching those remaining lines and that's not going to be the same resolution as the panel. Yeah? So I, I don't think that it, it, it makes uh, a great deal of sense. Um, it, it, yeah, most content 16 by 9. Let's, let's over here. There is, uh, of course, the, the cup, but... Okay, okay, let's just shortly, as, as a DLP, I think it's cool, but uh, it's, uh, it's I, different I, than, than... Nicola, I can't... Yeah, okay, no, cool. Just... Okay, and then behind there, there's some other stuff, I guess, but this is more like... Uh, uh, this is just uh, rounded edges. It's probably also something that's just just for trade show, what do you think? It's a bit of fun. I, 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 think, I think one of the things that we're really seeing this year at IFA is that people are doing lots of ideas to change the design of the TV from just being a big black slab on the wall or just sitting in front of the wall. Um, we've seen a lot of TVs that look like furniture. We've seen invisible TVs that turn into pictures. Okay, they've been around a couple of years, but everybody is now looking at this, which is saying, let's make a TV that somebody loves. Yeah, make, let's make a TV that offends some people and other people love it. Whereas up until now, we've just had products that, that offended nobody, but nobody felt excited about them. And um, do you know what? I got a bit of an affection for this one. There's not much in that little corner that you're ever going to miss. Really? In, in the picture. There's not much you're going to miss there. And it looks sleek. I think that's a bit of fun. I, I rather like that. A lot of phones are doing rounded edges also. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of like having a big phone. So we've got a 75-inch smartphone there. Um, and, it hasn't, and it hasn't got a notch either. Um, now, I, I think this is a bit of fun. And I think this shows that the industry is becoming a bit more playful. Right. So, uh, just very shortly, uh, this IFA is a little bit like being a kid in a candy store, right? There's uh, stuff happening with a TCL also. There's, 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 there's some new stuff. I think the pace of innovation is slowing compared to five or ten years ago. Um, it's a mature business. that The TV business globally is barely growing, um, and it's a replacement market. And we're now talking about refinements rather than breakthroughs. Um, it's also a market that's really struggling with overcapacity. It's a market that's struggling with low profitability. And so what we're seeing now is a lot of effort put in to try and bring value back to this market. And, you know, a lot of these little playful gimmicks and fun things and uh, design are really going to become much more important in the future. And uh, IHS Market, uh, your company that does... Uh Analysis of all this we, stuff. We, we research this business, we forecast this business. So you have all kinds of customers who are interested to know what's happening, so, right? So our customers include the brands, uh, the panel makers, the component makers, and above all, this is a, this is a big business. Um, so it also includes all the people who finance this business, for example. And uh, last, shortly, yeah. uh, Hisense, for example, on the dual layer is partnering with BOE. Yeah. And BOE is, uh, at the display week, we're said to be the biggest capacity. Yeah. They, they do, they have, in terms of area, they make far more now than anybody else. So there's a lot of, uh, hopefully there'll be customers for all this stuff, right? Um, that is the issue, that at the moment then, Chinese companies have staked billions, or even tens of billions of dollars, on everybody wanting a 65 or a 75 inch screen. Uh, and they've worked on the Field of Dreams business case that uh, if they build it, then people will come. At the moment, there is overcapacity. There's a lot of overcapacity, and that risks. It is already damaging profitability, um, and, and so making sure that the industry manages to go around the black hole and not down it is a critical problem. So, there's not everybody in India going to buy one. Um, it's got to be at a price that they can afford. It's just like smartphones. You know, in the smartphone business, the growth area is sub thirty dollar smartphones. In India. People buy 23-inch TVs because they can't afford a 32. Uh, and even if you sell a 32-inch TV at $100, which, by the way, means you don't make any money, um, then for many, many consumers, that is too much money. All right. Well, thanks a lot for this okay. video. No problems this at all, Nicola. to see this innovation happening. Yeah. I think IFA is pretty awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you.